morning, everybody, uh, to this session. I'm honored to facilitate this morning. My name is Natalie Lotzmann. I'm heading global health management at SAP. And I have the honor to facilitate this 10 years of best practice from EU OSHA campaigns today. So there are wonderful people up here and we will, they will share with you their insights and best practices, hopefully to give impulses and also inspiration for your respective organizations. We have a kind of a, a strict time uh, regime um, because we want to make it as exciting and lively as possible. So every speaker is asked to stick to seven minutes. Okay, this is challenging. And you will have the opportunity to raise questions after each session then. You can do this either as you were used to yesterday, so you can do it in, on your mobile app. So, Anik. Uh, yes, I hope today you can uh, enter Slavo again. And uh, then you have the choice to so the room which is for session three. All right. Okay, okay. So high check, but also high touch. Um, you mostly welcome also to raise your questions openly in here. And uh, so don't worry, it doesn't need to be uh, via technical thing. So before we start, um, I would like to um, open the stage for Dietmar because he's the real host here this morning, of course. He's heading the whole um, the projects around the EU OSHA campaigns and did mother stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, <coughs> uh, Natalie, for the warm welcome. And I would you also give a warm welcome of EU OSHA uh, that you made it to the session after the good party we had tonight, uh, yesterday night in the cathedral in San Mames, our famous sta football stadium, which will be also a UEFA uh, uh, 2020 stadium. And um, yeah, this, what is the session about? You, we heard already yesterday also from the commissioner that the campaign partners play a very important role in supporting the campaigns. And this initiative was born some 10, ten years ago. And uh, hmm? we have, this is to present the variety of uh, campaign partners. So it's on the yeah, one hand, it? clearly it's multinational companies who support the campaign also professional organizations, scientific organizations, so the social partners, uh, we have the trade unions here, so uh, they are all representing different organizations and we encourage all these organizations to uh, volunteer to be a campaign partner, to be uh, part of it and to send the message to their enterprises and to their networks. <laughs> And uh, now we have a possibility to, to uh, also share good practices and show what we actually, this variety of organizations, is contributing to the campaign. Thank you very much, and I'm lo very much looking forward to the session. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dietmar. And as you can see, Dietmar is very passionate about the topic of networking. He's actually the soul and the backbone of this whole initiative, this wonderful project about the campaign partnering, and uh, that's why we're here today. So Didma will also be our first speaker and sharing some insights on, on uh, latest research as well. And uh, so Didma, uh, now we start the official timekeeping. Okay, so we have Jan. Thank you for volunteering because this is a nasty job. Okay, so after five minutes we'll give a sign. And so that we have enough uh, room for your questions. And so then uh, it's up to you for the rest. All right, Dietmar. Yes, um, we follow all the same structure with our presentations. And um, first we want to present uh, shortly our organization. So we are EOSHA. We are actually a small European agency with only 65 workers. You may be heard in the media that some European agencies from London were transferred to the European Medical Agency, for example, with 900 workers. So you can see we are quite small one, but nevertheless, we have a big task. We have to, we would like to promote health and safety in all Europe. We might, would like to make European workplaces better. And therefore, as we are a small agency, we need our campaign partners, we need our networks, the social partners, the governments, the focal points. Um, you see here some data from us, so, so we are a very diverse organization uh, um, with 16 nationalities. 
We do also a lot of well-being activities, work-life balance activities, but I think we can learn a lot from our campaign partners here in this area. A short history of the campaigns. We are celebrating here the 10 years anniversary of the campaigns, uh, of the campaign partnership. We, the campaigns are going on for 20 years here. So we started in the risk assessment campaign with some 30 campaign partners. I think Ideal Standard is the one from us who already joined this campaign. And as a follow up, we developed the OIRA tool. So this is a legacy of this campaign, the over famous risk assessment tool. Then we started with a safe maintenance campaign. Some new partners joined, such as Toyota, for example, as maintenance is a very important topic for them, for the service technicians, for example. And following on that, I had the pleasure to be the content manager of the campaign, working together for risk uh, prevention, which is focusing on leadership and worker participation. And there actually the, the came the idea from the campaign partners Let's work even closer together. Let's have a kind of benchmarking. Let's really exchange good practices. And from that on, we had every two years a big meeting in Brussels, a good practice exchange meeting with all campaign partners. Followed by that, we had the stress campaign. Uh, we are also new campaign partners like SAP joined. We developed further the, the good practice exchange event in Brussels uh, with a good practice award. And uh, uh, also, um, the commissioner was handing over the award. So, so we, from the beginning, we had a, a quite high, high standing. You had heard uh, the commissioner yesterday. She was also emphasizing the, the, the role of the campaign partners. And when we in Brussels, when we have this good practice exchange meetings, she always comes to hand over the good practice awards and also the certificates. So there, there is a lot of appreciation from the political level. And this is also seen in the recent campaign of healthy workplaces for all ages. Um, yeah, it's a classical win-win situation uh, for us, for the agency, and for the campaign partners. We can exchange good practices. And the idea was not to have only every two years a big meeting in Brussels. No, we go further. We, we visit each other. We invite each other. And you see here the organizations who invited the others to come along for workshops on site. So you could actually visit the Toyota factory. You could actually see they are using EOSHA material, also in Ideal Standard in Sofitel. And that really shows that this is our contact to the workshops. You, you, you go in a factory somewhere in Sweden and you see EOSHA logo. That is really, for me, a fantastic experience that we really have this uh, impact uh, on the workplace. And of course, it's for, for uh, EOSHA, it's also an added value um, to, to support uh, the campaign partners and to have this direct contact to the workplace level. Um, we made a survey to, uh, to see what is the main motivation. So after each campaign, actually we do evaluation surveys and here is the result from our campaign partners. So. Most of them actually appreciate most of these networking activities, these benchmarking activities, as we called them in the beginning. And um, that's what we are here for. This is really motivating. This is also, a, let's say, a social network now, because our campaign partners say help each other, even without in us in being in the middle. They call each other if they have some questions. So it's really working as a network. And, um, they use this to learn from each other as a training possibility to improve their products and processes. And it's also, it's clearly, it's, it's good to increase the visibility of the organization to say openly, we are a US campaign partner. We publish it on our, our website. Uh, we are taking health and safety serious. We are uh, also, it's an, I think it's also internally, internally very important for the enterprises uh, that the health and safety department can say we are part of a bigger thing we are part of the european campaign and in some enterprises i know in the multinationals actually the health and safety and the headquarters is just coordinating things and the health and safety management is done in the plants so they have the task to coordinate to align them and they do this via the eosha campaigns and that that is really a interesting possibility to increase visibility and of course, we are also we have a steering group uh, 
uh, where we, uh, the, let's say, the most engaged uh, campaign partners come together, where we also discuss the, the next events, and where we think about how we could develop in the future. And here are some ideas also from our surveys, what we could do or what we should do in the future. And the first thing is of continue with this exchange of good practices. This is really our core business. Develop audiovisual materials that we are uh, beginning and getting better with data visualizations, with, um, with uh, NAPO videos and so on. So we have a long tradition there, but also there could be more developed, let's say. Uh, sharing multilingual documents. We have also multilingual, a multilingual tool like the OIRA tool and um, involve the campaign partners also in the beginning of the next campaign or before when we plan. For example, the next campaign coming up is about dangerous substances. So we already talked two years ago in the steering group uh, what can the uh, campaign partners do, how can we align with it, how can we collect uh, good practices and set smart goals for the OCPs. I think that's a very interesting idea, <laughs> uh, but uh, of course it's very ambitious and um, we, um, I think that's an idea to, to be developed. So I'm getting signs here. I think it's uh, really a win-win situation and I'm great that the network is working so well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dietmar. It's a great summary, and thanks also for, for, for creating a best practice of staying in time uh, for us. So, um, everyone uh, uh, be, be prepared if you have questions to Dietmar. Let me start with one question, uh, Dietmar. I mean, the, the EU OSHA, it, it really it, it works and it's impactful because it has a lot of groups, stakeholder groups, um, and, uh, and networks, of course. So what is, in, in, from your perspective, what makes it special, this campaign partner network? Yeah, the campaign partners, it's a network of volunteers, so really uh, organizations who really want to take part of the campaign. The other networks we have, um, they are, let's say, they are nominated by the interest groups for, for the social partners, workers and employers, from the government, the focal points, so they have all a kind of official nominated role. And here are organizations who, from their own, uh, let's say, because they are convinced that it is a good thing, they are supporting the campaign. And you can see also in the good practice events we, we have, how they, uh, yeah, how they celebrate this to exchange good practices, to learn from each other. And I think that is really the intrinsic motivation of this mm. network, mm. which is a specialty. Hmm. Yeah, I can confirm that from our perspective for sure. Uh, so are there any questions? There are not questions submitted uh, in the tool, but is there anyone in the audience who would like to address something to Dietmar? Okay. If this is not the case, you can all, always use the tool later if you like to. So it's not like uh, say it now or uh, be silent forever or something. So. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dietmar. And um, then we will come to our next speaker. Uh, this is David. And I would like to introduce you, uh, David um, uh, from Ideal Standard International. Da David is, I think, one of the first, right, from the very beginning in, in this network? Yes, we were one of the two yes. private enterprises start was on the, the start. first one. So yeah. this is yeah, wonderful. So David is a global director for health, safety and environment at Ideal Standard International. And actually, it was my first visit in, in one of your sites in Italy. It was very impressive, uh, the way you manage it, the way you communicate and, and hold the threads together. It was, it was wonderful. Um, David holds responsibility for leading and coordinating health, safety, environment improvement processes. He is a chartered mechanical engineer and fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, a member of the steering committee for the Health and Safety Council, for the conference board, also a member of European OSHA Healthy Workplace campaign partner and actively involved in the good practice exchange. That's why we're here. So thank you so much for, for being here with us and we are very excited to hear your presentation. Thank Stage you. Stage is yours. But for all the speaker, be careful. There is a step here, so don't fall. <laughs> he's, he's actually walking the talk, right? So normally, right, normally I started with the dream bathroom. So you can see our product, but I was told it's not possible to advertise. So, 
So this is the only chart that I have for the company. And we are Ideal Standard and we are based in Belgium. Our head, head office are based in Belgium. Okay? As uh, did my mention, we've been a long time on this partnership and we believe on this win-win partnership situation. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about, but the last bit, for instance, for the company, we get a lot of exposure in the market because everything that is produced by EU OSIA is sent to the 28 member states without paying any money, advertising costs, our material, our company name is everywhere. Right? So that's what we done on safety. <laughs> I'd like to start with my slide because the seven minutes is not very long. So this is the three motivators that we use in our company from all the way from the top CEO all the way to the people in the, the blue color in the shop floor. It's important that we do safe in, uh, health and safety because it's our moral duty, our ethical duty. And that we want to protect our people so they can come to work safe and go home safe. But the legislation is also there to protect the people. So I think we are working in the same area. The last bit is the business case. I think yesterday we were in the business Europe. Uh, we talked about some of the crisis, some of the big disaster. And the company losing so much money because they're not paying attention to safety. And in our company, safety is a core value. And we believe this is the smart, sustainable operating model. I'm not going to talk about too much about this, but again, we try to make everything simple. So something that I can remember even in my dream. So talent, culture, and process, this is what the base on our, our company. But I like to spend a bit more time on this because we keep learning. Even now, we're still learning from this. This is what we call it the DuPont story in our company. Oop. Something is missing, but three area, DuPont started to make sure that their process, their equipment are safe. And then they start working on rule and procedure. We call it a management system. And then finally, when they're getting better and better, they start looking at employee engagement. And Overall, about this, the most important for DuPont, they said, is the management commitment, formally or informally. Now, the problem is, in our company, if you don't buy our toilet, our bathroom, we don't have enough money to make sure all the process, the equipment are safe. So we have to work with all these four elements, and we believe these four elements is what we call it interdependent elements, like the, hum the, like the lung, the heart, the, the, the things in kidney in our human body. Without one of them, all our result will be just depend on luck. So you're lucky then when there is no accident and so on. But this is the four area that work. And some of the senior leader that come into our company was very surprised to see our equipment, to see our process. And as you managed to achieve the world-class performance on safety. And we said, yes, this is where we start. This is how we apply it in our company. This is our result from 2002. This dot is actually the real data every year, our performance per million hours. We started in 2002 with 16 accidents per 500 people working for one full year. And we end up 2016 last year at 1.4. So we've done many, many things, including those five years with EU Austria, 10 years, five campaign with EU Austria. And we've done a lot of things, including the ergonomic. I think one of the speakers today will talk a lot, focus on ergonomic. When you can imagine our product, you go to, back to your bathroom, you see the toilet, and the toilet is getting bigger and bigger. This is probably influenced by the American. They believe the biggest is beautiful. But just imagine, our people have to handle that in our factory. They have to lift, they have to place it in some way, they have to work on those. So ergonomic is pay a lot of things in our, our company. That's why last year in June, like Natalie said, we took all the team going into one of our factory 
And that factory, luckily, we have some investment already, so they can able to see some of the robot, some of the automation that have been introduced. But in general, a lot of the work are still manual, and that's where it uh, gone, tend to go wrong. That's it, so I must still have one minute extra for my questioning. <laughs> Thank, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Give a hand to David, please. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you really represent um, an ideal, it's not just in your company's name, uh, ambassador for, for industrial uh, safety in, in your premises. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, so if, if you have questions, um, you're welcome to raise them. I would just start, like to start with one, I'm sure um, you've heard about the BBS, the Behavior Based Safety Program. And, um, can you tell us something about this? I, I, I would assume that you have implemented something around this as well. Um, what no, is your... we decided not to take that route. Oh, that's interesting. So share this, please, with us. Okay. Do I get the slide? We, we still, extra? you still have one minute uh, added, okay. right? right? And to add the question, so. Uh. No, I think if I look at the what the accident happening, let's say this year, up to now, year to date, October, so the ten months we have 14 recordable accidents. But on the 14 recordable accidents, 93%, so that means 13 cases, are to do with what we call it the root cause with job factors. Mm. These are the technical uh, uh, design is not correct. These are the work planning is not correct and so on. So we believe this is not the, the right time to do behavior. Because when you talk about the traditional behavior program, it tends to pointing finger on the blue color. But when you're looking at 93% are to do with job factors, these are what the leaders should be doing, not pointing finger to somebody mm -hmm. else. So that's why we decided not to apply the behavior safety. But you see some of the chart that you see, we did a mm -hmm. be safe campaign. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were looking at the behavior of individual people also. You may sh do you have prepared something, right, for There that? is some slide there. Y if, yeah, uh, is, can is I it there? You can, you can just Push go. The yeah, one. It's, it should be so in then. what we decided, we decided to do two action. I think the action, so the first action is we want to address the total human factors. The, remember, not human behavior, it's a human factors, right? We want to do two things. One is we want to refine our risk assessment we want to look at implement extra control and not relying on human performance because people make mistakes. So number one, if we can put extra control or eliminate the hazard completely, then even when the people making mistake, nothing will happen. Accident will not happen, right? The mm. second part is we'll try to understand a little bit about human behavior. So <coughs> if we can implement different solution, focusing on fixing the system, the process, the organization, and rather than fixing the people. Because I, if I have 100 euro, I will spend probably 80, 85, 90 euro, spend on the process, the equipment, the organization, and spend the rest maybe working on how people work. And how do we do that? So for the first one, refine risk assessment, we do step by step, define the task, hazard risk assessment, refine it and to see what extra control do we have. We can start with the critical <coughs> based on his uh, historical accident and then apply those to identify the control defense and then put extra control in place. But the second part is understand human behavior. And again, we want to look at because people, the human actually process our information based on perception, based on memory, decision and action. I think that's important. So we try to adapt doing whatever we can. Perception, what do we mean by perception? We want to have communication, warning sign, is what the people can see, can hear, can smell. And I think that will remind people, hold on a minute, there's some dangers there. So maybe we have to be careful. We want to educate the people doing risk assessment, risk awareness, sharing good practice, but also sharing accident from plan to plan then hopefully we have the standard operating procedure or safe operating procedure so people can follow it. However, if we have engineering solution, 
like the Japanese call it the pokayoke, which is the foolproof. So if the engineering things can be there, if there is a barrier, there is control for the hazard, so even when our people making mistake, nothing serious will happen. I think that's what, at the end, what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are we still on time? Are there any more questions in the tool now in, in the audience? Okay, so thanks a Thank lot, you. David. Okay. So our next speaker, our next speaker is Xavier, Xavier Laraneta. Um, he's an elected member of the ETPIS, which is the European Technology Platform on Industrial Safety and Security. And he's also a member of the Executive Board and Secretary General of PISI, that is the Spanish platform of industrial safety and security. We're very happy to have you with us. The stage is yours. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, yes, uh, the, the, the European Technology Platform on Industrial Safety was uh, one of the uh, two dozens of platforms that, that were promoted by the European Commission to support uh, the uh, research uh, strategies during the last period of the Framework Programme 7 and for the H2020, that is the actual one. Uh, so, um, what we try to develop is to create uh, some kind of ecosystems to, in to include all the value chains in safety uh, with uh, representatives uh, of the different industrial sectors um, with the help of the, the research centres at university to develop uh, the, the strategic research agenda and even to promote cooperation to, um, to develop um, research and innovation projects in the areas of industrial safety, including occupational safety and health, process safety, uh, environmental safety, and emerging risks. So we've been working during uh, a dozen of uh, uh, years, and uh, two years later, we created in Spain exactly like a mirror group of platforms yeah, to, to, to develop the same strategies at a national level. And uh, in our case, we, we have uh, we've been more successful in, in terms that uh, we have a, a close cooperation between the different stakeholders, engineering companies, or corporations, and research institutes, and also uh, private consultants in, in safety, and also including some aspect of security. So we are dealing with conventional risks, the innovative industry and the new challenges uh, related, for instance, for, uh, from nanotechnologies, and also to, to support the development of new uh, products and uh, technology-based uh, services in the areas of uh, industrial safety and also in, uh, in security, crisis management, and so on. So during this uh, time, uh, we've been working in three main areas, uh, promoting projects, unfortunately, um, the work programs in, in the European Commission um, uh, thematic areas, um, although you could find safety uh, hundreds of times, in fact, only a few topics in every annual call uh, were available just to support the development of, of innovative projects on that. But anyway, we, we have developed uh, a dozen of uh, interesting projects related to integrated risk management, personal protection equipment, organizational safety. Um, uh, we even support the creation of an, an error net that uh, now is, is, is following as a joint programming uh, privately uh, supported and also including aging of infrastructure. So uh, we are a group of um, stakeholders supporting all this and with some cooperation with, uh, uh, with some academic uh, networks related to safety and reliability in industrial uh, sectors. Um, which are the, 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 the drivers uh, for uh, uh, the, the innovation and industrial um, technologies to support the, the industrial safety development? Well, there you can see some of them related to uh, the new ITC and also uh, climate change that, that, that is coming with uh, new uh, threats. Uh, so we, we are uh, developing some strategies and we created uh, uh, a network to support the ERANET uh, without the funding of the European Commission. So uh, we have been developing um, some uh, priorities 
to support uh, uh, small projects related to uh, industrial safety. And Aeronet is now uh, on, uh, on the fourth uh, call uh, that we will publish in, in a few days. Uh, and the, the, the topics for this year will be new technologies and the effects of major changes in industry, uh, how to measure and monitor uh, safety performance in, in the industry. <coughs> in the case of uh, Spain, uh, we could work more close with the, uh, it's easier if you work at, at regional or of national um, um, level, and uh, we try just to support all these strategies for innovation and technology development based on, on uh, uh, the people and the safety culture. Uh, upgrading uh, this culture also to security related to the new threats uh, like uh, uh, natural hazards and um, the critical infrastructure protection related to um, terrorism and other threats. So we, we have tried to base all this strategy for innovation and technology development on, uh, on people and creating a safety culture, although mm -hmm. we are focused on technology mm -hmm. development and trying to, to coordinate uh, the safety aspects that you can see on, on your uh, left side, um, safety, reliability, environmental safety, emergency management, with all aspects related also for security. In fact, um, the, in our strategic research agenda, we have a more detailed um, selection of uh, topics uh, related to new safety models relate, um, in the new paradigm of industry uh, 4.0, uh, developing more advanced risk assessment and management techniques, and not following also uh, the, the ISO standards, but also new cooperation between those uh, modeling uh, we've been uh, working also in the development of new smart and safe working environments, uh, include in, in personal protection equipment the new technologies uh, um, and, and to develop uh, wearables uh, in the same um, line of uh, technology development. Um, we are also uh, defining a new management system for assets and infrastructure based on new sensors, monitoring, instrumentation, uh, or what we call now is cyber physical systems, so the, the, the smartis smartization of the components, machinery, and so on, uh, including people as part of the, 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 the deployment of these new technologies. So um, we have defined these uh, new priorities and we are supporting all this in uh, the national research uh, plan where we have offered these uh, priorities and have been included on that. So we will have uh, the support uh, for the development of projects at the Spanish level. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Xavi. Um, I would like to, to know, go a bit deeper into um, uh, to understand how you actually identify the topics of research or your activities within your organization and how is it funded? Is it actually, is it a contribution from the, from the European Union or is it nationally funded or a mixture of both? Um, what can you elaborate a bit on this? Yeah, well, in, in fact... It and was get ready for other questions, of course, yeah. if you like. Yeah. In fact, it was easier for us uh, to, to develop this uh, kind of selection of uh, topics and priorities at national level. We have created the different working groups uh, where uh, specialists from industry and also from research uh, institutes uh, meet uh, two, three times every year. So we revise opportunities from technologies, even uh, explaining um, good practices uh, in terms of uh, new innovations that a company has started to, to introduce. Uh, so we, with the group, uh, can define that uh, that could be an uh, enabling technology to be introduced for the benefit of uh, a specific area of safety, industrial safety or process safety or whatever. So that, that way we, we are developing a lot of uh, uh, meetings just to support, oh, sorry, uh, to support uh, both um, uh, the, 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 uh, the selection of uh, enabling technologies and even with that networking, 
we can promote uh, even um, the, the, the starting point of consortiums to develop in cooperation between industry, engineering companies, and research institutes projects that could be funded by the national program, mm -hmm. uh, the national programs in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so now uh, we have had some problems during the last uh, four years because of the mm -hmm. crisis, and uh, the government couldn't offer uh, funding opportunities, not many, um, very few. But now that uh, things are going better, now we do have a, a, an extra uh, opportunity. And in fact, now we have uh, the national calls open mm -hmm. uh, during the, this uh, month until nearly um, uh, mid of uh, December to, to present uh, new projects. Mm -hmm. And um, in spring, we will have another opportunity mm -hmm. just to present uh, new exciting. projects related yeah. to more on, on industrial safety and not in occupational safety and health because mm. uh, it's considered like a legal compliance. Mm. So that's a pity, that's a problem it also mm. at the European level. The European Commission doesn't consider really safety or occupational safety as a priority in terms of innovation and, and, and technology development. Mm. For such a reason, there are a few mm. opportunities, there is only a, mm. a few topics, mainly in nano safety, they will get but there. not in the rest. So, they will get there. Yeah. Sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> but probably we are uh, 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 in the TPIS. We are doing things yeah. wrong because we yeah. cannot convince no. the European Commission to to put more money on. There's so on those many topics. passionate people on this topic. It will work out in the end. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any more questions to Xavier? All right. Then thanks again. Thank you. And uh, we come to our next speaker, which is uh, Victor. I'm very happy to have you, Victor. Um, Victor comes from a background of mining and safety engineering and has been head of first aid and rescue mine services. He's now a senior researcher at the European Trade Union Institute. It's a research organization of the European Trade Union Confederation. And topics that Victor works on is enlargement, OHSM, migrant workers, regional cooperation, and many projects, of course, and variable issues. So we're very happy to have you, Victor. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, in fact, I have two hats now in, on my head because, uh, as was said, I'm working <laughs> I, I work for Europe, European Trade Union Institute. I, my task is to introduce European Trade Union Confederation, which is uh, uh, official campaign partners for years. But we are very close. So the Institute was established by the Confederation as a, something like think tank uh, for, for, for many issues, political issues, economical issues, but also for, for health and safety. Uh, so, uh, when we speak about European Trade Union Confederation, I don't have time to, to say everything what is, uh, what is on, the, on the slides, but anyway, Confederation is a uh, workers' roof organization. So, it means that there are affiliates, it is created by affiliates of uh, all the Europe, not only European Union, but also uh, candidate countries and uh, waiting for, for candidate statutes. It was uh, founded in 1973, the headquarters in Brussels, and this confederation represents 45 million members in 89 train, uh, national trade union confederation in 39 countries, plus 10 industry federation in months, branch confederation. It means branch confederation. Of course, as such organization, uh, the, the main aim is improving the well-being of workers and their families to support principle of, of democracy, social justice and human rights and to build Europe as a prosperous competitive region with high living standards. ATUC is also, by the way, it's also a spokesperson of workers group in Bilbao agency. So, in fact, Bilbao agency is a tripartite organization. There is a staff of own staff of the agency, but the, the, the board is, the governing board is a um, decision-making body. And one third of the board is created by trade unions, one third by employers' representatives, one third uh, from governments plus commissioners in case of, of voting and um, problems. 
but we usually find solution uh, uh, before um, unnecessary voting. So it means that we are also, or ETUC is also involved in the preparation of all campaigns. So from idea, which topic should be selected, uh, which topic should be supported, uh, how the campaign, uh, which main messages should be disseminated via campaign, etc., etc. So, uh, in fact, we are part from the beginning, and because of such responsibility, we also have to take into account that we should be involved um, into uh, into into campaign very um, very. On, on, on a high level. So as you know, uh, the agency has also so-called focal point, which are something like small agencies in each EU country. Th these focal points are also tripartite. We have also uh, possibility to speak, to consult our people, our members in, uh, in the focal points to make a good national campaign, to be involved uh, in a good way and in case that something is uh, wrong, so to intervene and to try to, to put things into a into good level. So what is also a high interest of the ETUC is to use the campaigns also as a tool to involve more workers' representatives, to give them chance to, uh, to involve uh, health and safety committees in companies. So if they are not there, to create them and to give a uh, right to workers to give a feedback, uh, information from the workplace, what is happening, what is needed to change, and to help to building better health and safety or better health and safety management in the company. So in the last 10 years, there were several, uh, several campaigns, but was already presented by Dietmar. Uh, I put one more in 2007, it was campaign on lightened load, which was on MSDs, and we expect that the next campaign after dangerous substances will come back again to musculoskeletal problems, so to ergonomics and, and so on. And by the chance, we, we started now the campaign on, on MSDs. You can see a, a poster, because, because work shouldn't hurt, mm -hmm. and there is a short description of problem, and also there is a uh, there, is a, there is a proposal, talk to your safety representative if you have a problem with your body, <coughs> with some pain, etc. So there are also main, main problems, musculoskeletal problem, main, main causes. So we would like to, maybe we will pre-warn the, so the companies, the society, the trade unionists before the campaign will start in 2020. But this is just the part we do. Uh, we do more campaigns, but I also wanted to say as an example what ETUC also do via ETUI or via, um, their, uh, via ETUC committee, because there are several committees for different issues, for example, women committee, youth committee, they usually have an agenda also health and safety, and always they speak about what is on agenda of the, of the, of the agency and what is connected with campaign. So I can say in, uh, uh, during the uh, current campaign, Healthy Workplace for All Ages, and it is really, it was also one of very strong demand from trade unions not to speak about aging or the measures in the last 10, 15 years of the working career of workers, but to speak about prevention throughout all ages. This was mentioned also by, by Jesus uh, from the Commission yesterday. I remember this discussion. So we speak about prevention, and this is also the reason why in this campaign we can speak about nearly everything, each type of prevention. And I'm happy that, um, that David said that behavior safety is now not on the top of priorities of his company, because behavior safety we don't consider as a, as a real, real um, methodology how to make a workplace safer. So in, uh, during this uh, campaign, we organized, for example, uh, two meetings with the uh, winners of the, uh, of the campaign. So one was, was Western Balkan, when we met people from Rudnik company, the mining company. The another was uh, the course in Italy. We met the people from Tarkot, which is company, which was one among the winners. I, I see there are already some, 
uh, some uh, stopping alerts, but uh, I will take just five, uh, 30 seconds. So uh, also the, the big success was in case of campaign of, of, uh, of safe maintenance when we cooperated with Swedish firefighters and they used a very simple method, methodology for cleaning their stuff after intervention at the place of, of fire and they found that the, the, the danger of to get a cancer was really minimized because before some their colleagues died because of, of cancer. Already together with, uh, with, the, with the agency, the leaflets on, uh, on, on leadership and on the worker participation, which is still very useful, and also in uh, the leaflet of worker participation, there is a simple grid. You can fill it and you will see if your company is, uh, takes serious workers' participation, at, et cetera. So, for the future, because ETUC is also part of the European <coughs> legislative process. So, for the future, what we want to do for first, we work a lot now on campaign on car car cancer carcinogens. So as you know, after many years, the Commission changed the policy and started to, go, uh, to work back with legislation. And there is already prepared the first amendment of carcinogen, mutagen, and reprotoxin uh, directive. And there is an expectation that there will be more and more work on this. We know that 50, 50 carcinogens is responsible for 80% of death because of cancer mm. when people are exposed to, to carcinogen and work, uh, at work. Of course, we support uh, preventive structures, labor inspectorate, we pre uh, mainly workers' reps, but also preventive services. And we also are and plan be more focused on, on a new and emerging risk and especially psychosocial hazards, which is a really very, 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 very uh, burning problem. Capacity building of our representatives, of worker representatives, is enormous uh, important because without knowledge we can bargain, we can find, we can be um, productive in risk assessment, etc. So this is I'm over time, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, very hand, very hands-on campaigns. Um, I especially love the, the, uh, the headline, uh, work shouldn't hurt, right? And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite curious about the, the next upcoming campaign, which is about uh, dangerous substances. In, in your outlook, you have mentioned something with carcinogens. Do you have already an idea how, to, how you, this was, would fit in your next campaign? How would you contribute with your organization? Is there already some ideas you can share at this time? Yeah, it, it, we take it that it is a fantastic opportunity to disseminate more information about what is a real impact of carcinogens yeah. on exposure of workers to carcinogen and at, at the workplace. So, in fact, when there is a campaign, it doesn't mean that we have to be strictly in, a, in line on all, all, all messages. I suppose that our organization will take this opportunity to make more in a framework of carcinogen's campaign. Mm. So, there, is, there are already some results. Uh, I also, mm. I didn't mention that what ETUC and my colleagues, what we do, we do also lobbying. We, we are daily in European Parliament. We, we try to influence the um, economic and, uh, and social committee of the European Parliament when they have to vote for or against. And they even accepted several amendments which uh, trade union did in case of, uh, of um, novelty of, uh, of, uh, of carcinogen directive, including the post employment medical checkup mm. because majority of people die on cancer when they were exposed at work in their pension mm. uh, and and it means that we also have a failed statistics because mm. these people are not taken into account when uh, mm. when we have to to use statistics for mm. um, point. Mm. better preventive politics mm. thank you are there any more questions to Victor from the audience? All right, so Victor, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And uh, we come already to our next speaker. So I have the honor to introduce Jula Sabo from the Federation of European Ergonomic Societies at the FEES. 
And um, Jula is uh, actually the chair of communication and promotion committees of the FEES. Um, this is his, already his third campaign as a chair of this um, of his committee. And he also is the president of the Hungarian Ergonomics Society. Um, additionally, uh, Julia is an associate professor in Budapest, serving a two-year postgraduate OSH, uh, OSH course and assisting companies with, uh, with ergonomic programs. So I'm very happy to have you here, Julia. Uh, to Dula, and um, we, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the short uh, skipping introduction of fees. Uh, well, uh, I had some problems to compose this uh, slide because, well, I had a template for big uh, companies and the uh, fees is just a small, but I think a very important uh, uh, NGO and the real NGO. Well, uh, uh, yesterday I was very happy because I uh, could see ergonomics in action. Everyone is referring to ergonomics and, and I'm very happy that maybe, maybe David can uh, make my presentation better than I do. But uh, so it's really acting so, and, and this is the, the, the aim why we are here and, and we try to contribute in the EOSHA campaign. Uh, well, actually, uh, Natalie asked us to uh, give you some takeaway message. But uh, I think in this sense, I'm in a good position because we started with this. So we, we started to communicate what ergonomics can give you. And that was, well, on the slide, it was 2009 when we started the European Month of Ergonomics campaign with the, with the uh, Know Your Ergonomics uh, topic. This, is, this means that you have support, you have help, you, you, you can have or knowledge, you can use or knowledge and, and you can uh, meet your ergonomics and maybe uh, you can do it better. So wonder, it's, it's, uh, the result uh, we could see yesterday and, and is in this campaign and uh, 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 with the partners activity, I know it's wonderful, but maybe you can do it better if you use more uh, ergonomics uh, knowledge, you involve more ergonomic uh, professionals, maybe not just in big companies like here. Mm -hmm. You, you all, uh, all have ergonomists, but maybe in middle level or uh, in small companies. Well, so ergonomics is not equal to chair. And uh, uh, I must tell you that it's not equal to, to work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Maybe it's much more, but uh, Sometimes in the workplace, we narrow this uh, uh, discipline to, to MSDs or, or sittings. But on the slide, you can see what we promoted in the first European Month of Ergonomics eight years ago. Uh, well, uh, we have an objective. It's well-being of people and uh, productivity together. So it's a misunderstanding that ergonomics is just a charity to make more satisfied workers. Yes, it makes productivity better. It uh, decreases the uh, illnesses rate. It decreases, eliminates uh, accidents. So it really uh, makes profit to you. So it's beneficiary or, or as, as uh, OSH in general, it's a competitive uh, uh, factor. Well, what is ergonomics design? Uh, ergonomics design is human-oriented, human-centered design. Yes, yesterday we had plenty of uh, hints to this way. It's uh, task-oriented, so we always start with uh, work analysis and what, what to do, what, what is the job. It follows the system approach. So we consider all the circumstances in the workplace, environmental factors or, or even uh, uh, organizational barriers. And its objective, again, so its objective, we have uh, uh, defined uh, objectives when we start an ergonomics uh, improvement program. program. Yeah, it's uh, uh, in this slide, it's uh, it's uh, the first uh, time when we 
merged together the European Month of Ergonomics with the EOSHA campaign. So we recognize that, well, uh, October is full of campaigns and full of, of uh, very important dates. So uh, our voice is very low and, and we can't uh, do anything when, when the, there's an EOSHA campaign running. So we merged our efforts. So we decided uh, to merge these two activities. And in phase, we decided that in, uh, in the European Month of Ergonomics, we promote the EU, object, uh, EU uh, OSHA campaign. But not, we, we don't, uh, want it, uh, didn't want it to uh, uh, repeat the message because there are plenty of channels, media partners, and so on. We, de we decided uh, to show what is the role of ergonomics in the campaign. So how can we help uh, to, to make that uh, given uh, campaign better. So there are some examples uh, from the uh, or, or European Month of uh, Ergonomics campaign materials in different languages, I think. And uh, where well, sometimes uh, the campaign is closer to ergonomics, may, sometimes it's uh, a bit difficult to show, but uh, like in the load was clearly ergonomics, but, but uh, the participation uh, with uh, working together campaign uh, was, was uh, very, uh, very ergonomics related. So yes, I, have, I, uh, I again must uh, emphasize that FACE uh, is an NGO. That means we are working on voluntary basis in every, every level. So I want to uh, thank Marty Lauris at Finland who is preparing the, the campaign materials. Yes, and uh, uh, the future, future, future size. So I think uh, it's obvious that we will continue with uh, the next uh, campaigns. So I, I was imagining Brenda saying, guys, there's no next campaign. So it's nonsense. So, uh, so that would be the information if we stop with the campaign. So I think this is, uh, this, is this campaigning is, is wonderful because we already have the structure to campaigning. So we, we are expecting the next campaign. We know how to do it. We have structures and uh, where well, we fix structures and, and all uh, member societies at national level are uh, focal point partners. So everything is going smoothly and, 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 uh, and, and we, we, we can only uh, facilitate uh, the activities at, at uh, national level. Thank you. Dula, mm -hmm. thank you very much for sharing this. Um, from my perspective, actually, ergonomics is the topic that is actually a topic in every single organization. Regardless of size, regardless of industry, regardless of country, ergonomic questions are everywhere. And it's good to have a partner like you, and um, you share a lot, and, and also on your, um, on your website, etc. So, um, just one thing, very practical questions. Um, how could you find, if, if you are a, a small or medium-sized company and you do not have all the, re, the rich resources that uh, big companies are easier to have access to, so where could you find an ergonomist, someone who, who helps you with this? So would it, would it be via your organization or is there a general platform or something practical you share? Yeah, <coughs> uh, I think in general everyone is a bit ergonomist. So mm -hmm. when you are improving your workplaces, you are in an ergonomic sense. But mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, in some, sometimes you make it in a trial and error uh, approach. Uh, sometimes you uh, use some uh, discipline and, and knowledge and, and best practices. So uh, I think the, the aim to, to go to, to do ergonomics, to improve workplaces, to reduce risks uh, uh, leading to musculoskeletal disorders or ergos and, 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 and bad quality. But uh, sometimes you need some uh, more professional uh, help. And uh, for this purpose, first you can contact, and I think this is the other takeaway message, that you can contact your local uh, ergonomic societies. Uh, the ergonomic societies are around uh, Europe. You, you can find and contact and, and, and work together with your society. 
but uh, there's a, a person uh, a quality system in Europe. This is the register of uh, ergonomists, uh, register of European ergonomists, where uh, we have uh, 500 uh, ergonomics in the register and uh, you can know that in the register only can a person with a, a strong educational background with, uh, uh, with revised uh, uh, supervised training and with plenty of projects done and then you can go in the system with, with after a, a very very strict peer review uh, uh, process and you need to maintain your knowledge. So uh, uh, CPD, uh, continuous professional education plan should be carried on. So yeah, Dietmar is one of them, so <laughs> it's a good example. All right, thank you. Any more questions from, from the audience here? There's one, yeah, just re read it to us. and he asked, are there any, are you in this room? Okay. Um, the question is, are there any tools you are aware of on how to advocate the governments? The IOMSC are drafting a toolkit on this to be launched at the ICO uh, conference in 2018 in Dublin. So the question is, are there any tools you are aware of on how to advocate the governments? It's <coughs> maybe you show this to show it to him, maybe it's easier to read. Are there any tools how to advocate to governments? So it seems the person, Nick seems to say that the IOMC is drafting a toolkit on this to be launched and maybe he wants to know how, he, how you can help distribute this toolkit, is that that's how I would read the question. Huh? No. <laughs> Thank you. So, so uh, first, I, so, I couldn't read it. So, Nick, uh, if you're in the room, it. please, could, could you just go in direct dialogue? That probably would help, be helpful. So, uh, may, uh, John, John, could we just have the, the mic over there? Thanks. Good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Martin O'Halloran and I'm Chief Executive of the Health and Safety Authority in Ireland. We are strong advocates of ergonomics, but I'd be very interested to hear um, what can ergonomic societies do to make their language more accessible to uh, shop floor workers? Because those, as we see from the keynote lecture yesterday, who potentially could achieve the best benefits during their work and in their retirement are those who probably do not understand the language of science or have the skills or information. So what could the ergonomic societies do to make their language more accessible to ordinary workers? Well, uh, actually, there are plenty of tools, and uh, I think there are not, not only risk assessment tools in, in ergonomics, but uh, only solutions. For example, my favorite is the ILO, uh, IE, uh, common uh, uh, um, tool. This is the ergonomics checkpoints, and this is this version second. So it's, it's very uh, easy to understand, accessible in, in, in plenty of languages, and full of ideas. So I uh, recommend you to go to the ILO website, uh, download it, uh, 500 pages full of ergonomics and full with, with, with bright ideas. And uh, well, uh, I, 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 I like this uh, uh, ergonomics checkpoints because uh, uh, it was developed by the best people uh, in the world. 20 plus years ago, and uh, after uh, several years of practice, it was revised. So it's it's really good stuff. Uh, just uh, one more thing: uh, the the the, the uh, uh, ergonomic checkpoints in agriculture and uh, with uh, psychosocial risk is uh, available too, uh, and it uh, runs on uh, mobile smart devices too. 
So it's, it's very, very, very useful. Well, uh, the problem is that there's no uh, uh, money for translation, but as I mentioned, we are working on voluntary basis. So, for example, I managed to translate uh, this ILO checkpoints, or I managed to translate the ergonomics principle standards uh, uh, 26,800 to Hungarian to my native language, and it's it's accessible in uh, in in our language. So. Well, uh, uh, everyone uh, needs to take care uh, of, 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 of the uh, national uh, knowledge. Like uh, in the uh, Oshviki, we make translation ourselves. So this, this is what, what, what mm. I can tell you. Mm. Thank you. Mm. It seems a very substantial question that you've raised here, um, especially to for special target groups. How could we improve here, right? Um, I'm not sure if, if everything was, was answered to your satisfaction, so maybe you, you also uh, link up uh, afterwards uh, for, for more detail, but that could be beneficial also for your work, right? You seem to have deeper knowledge in this. So that's, that's one of the things we share, uh, that's that what makes it valuable. So don't be shy. If there's anything that you would like to, to say or to, uh, um, be, uh, to bring in, it adds value to everyone. All right. So any more questions to Jula? No, this is not I the case. I had the most question. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ula. Thank you. All right. So we're coming to our last but one speaker, which is Tom. I'm very happy to announce you, Tom Schallenburg, from Toyota Material, ha Material Handling. It's not the cars, it's the forklifts. Okay, Material Handling, Toyota, forklifts. All right. So, um, uh, Tom actually is a Sustainable Development Director at Toyota Material Handling Europe. And he's responsible for sustainability reporting, environmental man management and health and safety for an organization with 10,000 plus employees across Europe. Uh, he's a member of this um, uh, Committee for Good Practice Exchange already for four years now organized several local events uh, for us, which was always great. And um, very happy to, to add that uh, this year you have received with your team a recommendation from EU Commissioner Thyssen for, their, for your contribution to uh, uh, EU's healthy workplaces. So congratulations for that. Some of you might have been here uh, this spring. All right, so uh, Tom, we are very happy and excited to hear your, what you have prepared for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for this kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, what is the role of a sustainability director? Well, my, or anybody in the role of sustainability, uh, my perspective is that it's our responsibility to move the dial of business beyond just making profit. It's giving the, co the companies we work for uh, the aim to go beyond just legal compliance. So if we're talking about health and safety or environment and just making sure that we, we comply with led regulations, that's, that's a compliance different approach. Sustainability is taking that one step further, talking to stakeholders that matter to our organization, our employees, our customers, our suppliers, our local communities, and asking them what are the topics that really matter to you, where, we, where should we move the dial, where should we actually do more than just follow the legislation. One of the top topics, uh, according to our stakeholders, uh, both our employees and our customers, is safety. For our customers, that's product safety. For our employees, that's, of course, safety in our workplaces. Um, this is why um, you know, our sustainability strategy, we called it uh, dual impact, together we make a difference. And our number one priority within that sustainability strategy is to maximize safety and health for Toyota employees and for our customers employees. And very much we try to, to package that together as saying actually safety and health is, is one competence. Uh, and that's kind of something that has been useful for us because in the past we had people that were responsible for safety for our operations and people that were safety, responsible for the safety of our customers. And there's a considerable overlap 
uh, and since we've been bringing those more together, we see that we can add more value to customers and as well learn more from our customers uh, in this area. So this is actually one of the reasons um, we partner with EU Russia, because myself, I have a background in environmental management. I manage climate change topics. So um, we... You know, we identified that maximizing safety and health was, was a priority, and that's why we've seen very much the, the partnership with the agency um, as, as very useful um, because um, it gives us communication material that are, uh, give added power to um, of Asia Russia to convince our internal stakeholders from the management level to local middle management to, to employee level. We can learn from our customers uh, or you know, our, our peers, such as David, you know, one of the gurus for me in, in, in terms of you know, driving health and safety performance through an organization with his impressive uh, presentation he did earlier. Um, we have a focus group to pilot safety and ideas and innovations and we can provide our network with up-to-date health and safety expertise and, and best practices in, in 27 languages of the EU. If you see the figure on the right, then you also see that we've taken inspiration from, from, uh, from David's uh, framework. We come with, when we would talk about uh, zero accidents, um, you know, we come back to also those four, same four elements of leadership, equipment, people, and processes. Um, just want to also share the, the best practice case study uh, that uh, helped us to, to gain a commendation from uh, the, uh, the Commissioner Marianne Tyson uh, for the work that's been done by our colleagues here in Spain. Um, we have 10,000 employees, 4,500 of them are service technicians that go out to customers to fix forklifts. And in Spain, the issue was that they had high numbers of, of absence, and the number one root cause was um, back, back pain due to, to heavy lifting. We have you know, big parts to our big machines, so you can imagine the lifting uh, requirements. So we are, um, in, in Spain, we invested in physiotherapy and er stretching sessions, so we'll go back to the ergonomic uh, 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 theme, um, where injured employees were treated and re-educated, and then which was rolled out not only to the ones that were injured, but to all service technicians, and finally in a third step to all employees that were re-educated. And in the bottom picture, you see a picture of um, service technicians using the trucks as, as, as a support for stretching exercises before they, they start the actual work. Um, this reduced absenteeism by 27% in two years, wow. increased well-being and employee satisfaction, but also most importantly, something that it's, it's replicable across the organization, the financial payback is in, in a quarter of a year. So the argument across Europe to our other uh, sales companies that are having the same activities is why aren't you doing it? This is, this is giving us fee, uh, a, a positive return as well as having all the other benefits. Looking ahead, um, I think what is, is key for us is that employee health and safety was recognized as a major issue in 2017 internal sur survey after working eight years with the agency. In 2013, it was only rated as a medium level um, Topic. So it's really, it shows for me the, to the impact of the working with the EU Archer campaign over time. We have um, new internal health and safety policies which provide our subsidiaries with a roadmap to progress. And what we do need to do is to continue developing our innovative solutions for the significant challenges our customers face in material handling safety if we want to stay market leader in our area. 10% of injuries in industry across Europe, of major injuries across Europe happen with material handling equipment or with forklifts. So we constantly need to, to, to find solutions and innovate 
um, to make sure that this number goes down. Thank you very much. Mm. Thanks a lot, Tom. I'm very impressed, especially by the figures. I mean, to, to have um, the, the absence rate reduced by almost 30%. I mean, that is something, right? And it shows that it, it also it, it's really worth doing it and, and having it in a in a very um, a comprehensive way as you come from from various angles to to, to come into uh, uh, into these to these results. Um, I would like to to ask you something about your engagement here because I mean you're you're doing a lot right and um, obviously you're a very busy man. You're right now your Toyota material handling is. Um, uh, I think it's the fourth uh, uh, campaign that you're partnering with. Mm -hmm. So just, just a very basic question. What's in for you? What's in for Toyota material handling um, to, to stay that long and to really co uh, constantly engage? I could have asked the same to David, but now it's uh, just... Uh, so what is, what is actually the value add for you? And that might be something of interest for, for some of you who might want to think about uh, uh, joining as well. It's it's some work. It's some it's an engagement. But what's in? Um, I think some of the points I've touched upon, and I think for me, it's the access to 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 experts uh, from from other companies, but also from from uh, workers' representatives uh, from governments and the different the richness mm. of exp uh, of perspectives. I think this is a unique forum that you know it's very hard to to mm. get this anywhere mm. else. Um, and you know we continue getting getting innovative ideas four years ago we did an event in in in, in sweden and it was actually a, 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 an improvement suggestion from one of the workers representative organization that helped unblock a, a project a safety innovation project that we were working on mm. um, another example is that uh, uh, last year, we were invited by FIO to it was the Finnish Occupational Health and Safety Institute to join a, uh, a, a safety research project into our ISAT application, which is our fleet management application mm. to manage the safety of, of, uh, mm. of our fleets. And they wanted to test it with, with four uh, mm. Finnish companies, and they provide, they organized the grants mm. and, and they organized everything around it. So, mm. so I think um, we're constantly getting mm. getting value from 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 our partnership mm. and mm. and so that's why we continue to be with mm. our member sounds great so, sounds like really an opportunity to connect the dots and to to uh, m uh, to uh, uh, have a take advantage a real solid tangible advantage of networking and and getting into contact yeah that's that's best practice in this so are there any questions to tom before we proceed Okay. Tom, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. So last but not least, I have the honor to introduce Trish to you, Trish Patricia O'Callaghan. She's leading health promotion globally at SAP with responsibility for employee awareness and engagement around SAP's two-pillar approach of individual and organizational health. And this includes driving regular global awareness campaigns, such as the current campaign, EU Russia campaign, um, for all ages. Um, she has achieved more than 50,000 engagement all over the world in, in this campaign. And she also um, develops leader and employee training and, um, and enablement. And she leads our health ambassador network that ensures that we have people in all locations worldwide who actually are advocates for health and safety at work. So welcome on stage, Trish. Uh, we're excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. It's also good to stand up. The room is quite warm and sitting down for an hour <laughs> and a half is making me sleepy, no reflection on the speakers. So maybe if you were feeling a little sleepy, stretch your legs and stand up. It's one of the things we often do in our, in our meetings, especially with our health ambassador meetings. We get them all to spend five minutes doing little desk, um, desk stretching exercises to keep our brains um, alert. So uh, thank you for joining us today. So um, as you may know, SAP is a, an IT knowledge-based industry. So this means for us that people are our differentiator and the drivers of our success. 
Because if you think about it, it's people who innovate. It's not the, the organization or the organizational structure. It's, it's the people. Now, we all know that when we feel good and feel healthy and happy, we work quite well. And it's common sense, really, when we think about it on an individual level. But it also makes business sense to invest in the health, the happiness, and the, the well-being of our employees. And in SAP, we, we make that connection. We connect how we care for our employees with business success. And we do this, firstly, by understanding the psychosocial um, VUCA challenges people face in our modern digital workplace. So VUCA, as you may know, stands for the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And this is all the... Um, the 24-7 permanent connectedness, the, the feeling of always needing to be on, having multi-mobile devices on our hands and always um, be, being switched on with the workplace. And that constant change, the, the rate of, of technology is moving so fast that people can often feel that, that, that pressure. Um, so this is what we talk about, about the, the psychosocial VUCA challenges uh, in the workplace. So but then we also try to foster um, a healthy leadership and working culture that really provides that, that psychological um, safety. Because, because we are an IT-based, um, our knowledge-based industry, our employees um, may face non-traditional um, stressors or non-traditional risks that, that um, many of our speakers have spoken about in the traditional manufacturing uh, environment. So we want to provide this culture that really provides psychological safety, that people feel that they can come to work in their true selves or their authentic selves, um, that we meet their, their needs, their everyday needs, um, and that they really feel empowered to, to give it their best every day um, and really to, to reach their, their full potential. And I actually read um, an article recently on the Huffington Post um, in which it quoted research on an LGBT survey in which 85% of the respondents said they waste too much time hiding their, their true selves in the workplace. Now this is really sad and bad for the individual that they have to really consume energy of their working week to hide their true selves. But on the business impact, and this is the, the worrying part from the business perspective, 61% of those people said they do not work as hard for their employer. So this is psychological safety, this enablement or this, this freedom to allow people to come to the workplace every day in their true authentic selves, it really helps them reach their full potential, feel valued, trusted, respected. And this is um, one of our, our definitions of health uh, in SAP. So we look at health in, in two pillars. We look at the individual health, and this is empowering the employee to really uh, leverage the, the programs and the offerings that we have in SAP. But it is essentially their own ultimate, or ultimately responsibility to, to really take control of their health. On the organizational side, we provide all these, um, these pillars, these, these, the policies, the strategy, the, the programs to, uh, to foster that culture and to really empower the, the person. So we, we really talk ab about um, having an environment that's based on, on, on respect, on trust and empathy. So people really do come in um, as, as their true selves. And this is what we love about the, the OSHA campaign, because in SAP, when we talk about the, the culture, it's all about talking, talking, talking. It bring everything out of whatever taboo zone, out of whatever concerns, and get talking. And having these events with the speakers like, like this, uh, where we share practices. And I know many of you are coming from different cross industries, and we would love to hear from you, maybe in the, the Q&A at the end, um, what concerns you have, um, if the, the speakers here have addressed um, any questions you have, um, because it's all about sharing. It's not just us pushing information, it's also you know, a two-way stream. Um, and you know, talking is just so important, um, and how, as I said, th these events like this are so important for us. And it also is a value add for you, because when we talk about culture, sometimes it's very difficult to, to really understand and to, to measure the culture, because we all know culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and this is um, a, a quote that uh, many people know from Peter Drucker, who's our, our guru of modern management. And it is you know, so true that 
on even an SAP on the organizational side, we can have the, the, the best policy, the best strategy, the best programs, the experts in all our locations supporting our 80,000 people. But if our 80,000 people don't feel um, empowered or that, that freedom to really avail of, of these, that's our strategy and planning out the window. And you know, this is something that we all need to, 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 to really consider. It's the culture. It's not just the, the, the training, the resources. It's really seeing people avail of the programs and really walking, um, walking the talk. Um, so then, you know, sometimes it's also fine. It's, it's measurement, but how, how do we know our, our, our culture and how do we know we're on our right track? So it's more about just discounted um, gym membership or our yoga classes. Um, it's easy to tick those boxes on, on paper. So it's, it's more than that. It really is connecting people socially and offering that psychological safety uh, I spoke about. Because these can often um, bring about a, a higher business return when we connect um, these people socially. And understanding and measuring these sometimes perceived intangible um, 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 items, are it, it's not so difficult. It's within our, our reach. And you may say a company like SAP, we're large, we have all the resources. But I'm going to uh, present here our Business Health Culture Index. And it really is a scalable approach that really will help organizations to, to measure um, the culture, to get that, um, that feeling of what really employees feel. So we ask um, in our people survey, an annual survey, nine questions around seven topics that range from the, the topics you can see here on the screen. The actual questions are really simple, things like, um, um, I have um, trust in, in my leadership. <laughs> I'm last speaker. Do I have a... No. <laughs> I'm getting the signals. God. Not really. Um, I, OK, thank you. Uh, another minute. So we have um, these, these questions that, that we ask. Um, we calculate a net promoter score, and we know in 2016 we have a, a business health culture index of 78%. Now, you may say, hmm, it's not so high, but the impact is for every 1% change, we know that it can impact our operating profit by between 80 and 90 million euro. Now, again, you may say, well, that's a huge company, you've got big resources, you've got big employees, but the, the, the calculation behind this, it's very simple, the questions are simple, they relate really to people, their um, their day-to-day -day things like, um, like stress. Um, for example, the, the question around stress is, um, I feel um, enabled or the level of stress I have is acceptable to me. Um, so you know, maybe, maybe can I just give one little scenario um, before I, I, I move on? You know, it's about I spoke earlier that you know if you have all these policies in place and if nobody picks up or really has that that freedom to to really avail of it, everything is going to to go out the window. And this is um, our example from SAP Netherlands, who's the award winner for the Healthy Workplaces for All Ages campaign. This started off as a as a local um, program in the Netherlands, a location of 600 employees. And they wanted to really address an issue that was um, of current concern to employees. They noticed that the average sitting time was 13 hours per day. And they wanted to really combat that sedentary uh, working lifestyle. Because we know, and as many of our speakers have spoken about, these healthy habits that, that um, bring us into retirement and our older age for healthy aging. So they designed a one-year holistic program that addressed both working um, styles and home life. Um, um, all participants, 50%, including a 50% engagement from leadership, so it was a great having that, that management support. They all had um, activity trackers to help them take control of their, their, their health, their movements. Um, they offered a holistic program ranging from, from counselling, ergonomics, um, risk assessments, um, both for the work and for the home life. So the result after a year, there was 100% increase in desk increases. There was 30% in physical activity right across through the working day and into home life. So there was a holistic improvement um, for, for people's lives. Um, due to the success um, of the program, uh, we have taken that and designed a global program, which we launched earlier this year, to help people um, bring in constant movement throughout the day. We are an IT-based um, company, which means most of us are sitting down sedentary for eight, nine hours a day. So um, with 9,000 people globally um, in our global program, um, where we have um, uh, our, our 9,000 people all um, uh, connecting through their activity trackers to help us uh, really 
foster that culture of, of moving through the day. Simple things like if we're having a meeting with Natalie, who's in Germany, I am in Ireland, I often walk around my, my house when I'm speaking to her on the phone. Things like that, just to, to get up and keep moving. These are our photos, simple photos of, of what was introduced to really get into the, the culture um, of the people that goes beyond the strategy and the, the policy. So looking forward um, ahead, we've spoken about healthy habits and a couple of the speakers really speak ab about you know, the long term. And this is what uh, we try to do in SAP. So we do have our strategies. We want to strengthen that culture um, of, of trust and empathy and empowerment. Um, but we also want our employees to really understand that they are in control and the, ha the habits they have now really do impact them later on in their careers and, and into retirement. I've missed a lot of stuff, Natalie, <laughs> but I'm very proud of SAP. <laughs> so, so what we can say is you can tell that pride and passion eats rules for breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. It's so, one of my faults, Natalie. No, no, that's, so that's, that's, that's fine. I, I mean, if I, if I had to choose sticking someone sticking to rules and someone being passionate, I, you know what I would choose. Anyway, so um, when Dietmar and I were, were thinking about how to set this up to have the most benefit and the value for you, we were thinking about having a, a, oh, a, like, a like a chime flow as well. And that is, there's no, not a coincidence that SAP is at the end and that uh, David is in the beginning, who is very passionate about a, a, um, an approach towards, um, uh, towards a saying, a sentence like, we're not into behavioral safety. We, we believe that it's, an, it's, a, uh, it's the duty of, of an employer to do everything from technical side that is ever possible, right? And we truly believe in this as well. And so there, there are many other voices in between who, have, uh, who showed you um, their, their perspectives on, on their respective um, um, fields of expertise. And now we come to, to, to the end of, in the way, of the era of time where SAP, who has not any uh, traditional uh, health hazards at the workplace besides um, uh, office ergonomics, right? But we face the new era of health threats due to VUCA world, which every one of you, regardless where you come from, also face, right? But for historical reasons, health and safety historically faces, um, um, focuses mostly on, um, on areas where more or less in the manufacturing area. That is where most of where, where it historically comes from. But when we see the number of workplaces generally, we can see that the manufacturing workplaces decrease and decrease and decrease. That right now in Europe, they're around 24%, uh, so relatively stable. But the rest, the 75%, it's not non-manufacturing. It's all people who also have hazards at the workplace. But historically, we do, did not focus this. Why? Just because we, did not, we were not aware that there's a hazard. Second, we do not know how to assess it. We do not know how to approach it. We do not know how to measure it. All these things. So that are the challenges of the future. That means every one of you who is already very, very much engaged into health and safety in the more traditional way, please have a look at the whole population you're in your area. Who do you not regularly address? And this is most, a lot of people who are office workers, who are um, knowledge workers, people who are not in the manufacturing area, besides the, the, uh, uh, the plants as well. So we're looking for, for solutions there, how to engage people, and we're very much looking into the area of uh, culture. And culture is something that is very important because David is not saying don't care about culture. David is saying it's a priority. Do your homework, do everything that you can from a technology side, and then we can, and the culture of course is part of it. So it's not an either or, it's both. It's just an, an addition, an again song, how do you say this? A, um, to make it whole, right? It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an additional perspective on the whole thing. All right, so we, in, in, your, in the last example, we've had, um, uh, we had when uh, this uh, run your way um, thing, which is a, a, a wonderful um, uh, um, 
tool that we can use. And this again shows that this is something we could all use, right? Because there's something in common that we all have that is often lack of exercise. It's often uh, it's uh, the question of nutrition as well. How do we how do we uh, feed? And um, so these are things that we can today we can also assess from from a technological side. So Trish, are there any um, tips that you have from taking into consideration that obviously it's not a matter of company size, it's not a matter of industry. So if someone wants to use technology. Mm -hmm. to enhance, for instance, uh, more uh, engagement, more team building in the field. Mm -hmm. What would be the steps uh, to, for, for them, how to proceed if, if someone yeah. is interested? Okay. Well, certainly using technology is the, is the way to go. Um, there are so many great um, apps already out there, some really, really good vendors. My first um, idea would be to look what's out on the market, but don't just look on, on the visual side, on the interface, mm. see what's underneath, what you, what you from the organisation perspective could take from that. Um, it's, it's not just a steps challenge you want to look at, you want to see that holistic picture. Um, so look for a right vendor who, who can give you a lot of background and information on our, our data analytics. Um, by all means, we're very happy to share with you more detail on the platform that we have um, developed um, in-house that was based on the, the, the Netherlands program. But the vendor is very important to see what kind of information they can give. Yeah. And oh, then, right. of course, knowing what your employees need, it's, it's all down to your culture to, to really get people involved. No point in offering them something that doesn't, that's not relevant for them or they don't or have it's time no or interest or boring. Mm, yeah. Fun. We like fun in SAP. Mm. Mm. <laughs> all right. So any questions to Trish? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is George Scrubellos. George will be fine. I'm representing the uh, 24 countries of the European Federation of National Maintenance Society. I'm actually the chairman of the Safety Committee, Health, Safety, and Environmental Committee, to be exact. I would like to ask this very won wonderful, very successful program that was implemented in the Netherlands. Um, uh, was it implemented uh, somewhere else in Europe? Because SAP has uh, offices everywhere, including Greece. Uh, and uh, are you uh, yeah. familiar with the results? Were they successful? Yeah. Um, the, the, the program in, in this design was in the Netherlands only. Um, it is a holistic program um, that has the activity aspect of it too, but also that, um, uh, that holistic and, and lifestyle program. So it, in this current design, just Netherlands. We have taken um, the, the, the activity part of it and enhanced that for a global program. So we're looking at how we can um, take the, the overall Netherlands package to see how we can tailor it for other locations. It was a huge success. The feedback was, was great. If I had another 30 minutes, I would talk about it. <laughs> and yes, it was in Greece yes. as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, it sorry. I, missed, I missed that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Any more questions? Any more questions to all of us in here in front? OK. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Smith from Business Europe. Um, I have a, a general question to all of the panel because um, as, as you will have heard yesterday, we're also an official campaign partner as Business Europe and a lot of what we do as official com campaign partner is also trying to reach out to other companies, to our national member organizations, some of which are here today. But of course, the people that we see on the stage here are the converted. You've felt that there was a very good reason to get involved in the campaign and one thing we struggle with is we're all busy everybody's very busy and really pinpointing to people who maybe don't yet see the interest to get involved in the campaign really convincing them to do that is, is not easy i think and i wonder if the panel has any suggestions or ideas of how do we reach out to more companies to get involved in the campaign? How should we be doing more as an employees organization? Do you have any tips about the kind of messages we can send out? Because 
of course, it's great that we have so many people involved, but it's always good to have more. Thank you. Tom? When I talk to the agency, I, I, I don't have the impression that it's about creating, having more partners, but it's about creating more engagement and, and getting more eyeballs. Um, what we do uh, is we put the campaign summary and the references to, to it on our website, but also on all our 27 national websites in all the languages of the, of the EU and, the, and EFTA and etc. So it's, it's available on every uh, Toyota material handling page. Um, we, we present it, for example, at our, our campaign or at our European Supplier Day every year in front of 500 key suppliers. We, a lot of our local sales companies actually have the information from the campaign when they go to trade fairs and they reach out. You know, 80% of our customers are, are SMEs. Um, so we try to integrate it into to, to the way we present ourselves to the market and that's what we try to, because most 80% of our suppliers and 80% of our customers are, are SMEs, so we're trying to, to do our bit that way. I, I, would, like, I would like to share some thoughts on this, um, because it's, it's a very, very essential question that you've raised. And the essence of this is recruiting, okay? So what? Do you, what's in for a person? And I would like to, because I, I've always believed that there's much more into that questions and things and ideas have in common that separates it. So let's look at recruiting. The recruiting idea, so what we know about recruiting is that people come because of an idea. They come, and this is a personal thing. So you need also, there's nothing that is,